Hello, and welcome to the Draft National Transmission Needs Study Webinar. I'm Whitney Bell with ICF, and I will be your host today. First, we have a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. This WebEx meeting is being recorded and may be used by the U.S. Department of Energy. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. <clears throat> if you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed consent to recording and use of your voice or image. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you need to view the live captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat momentarily. If you have any technical issues or questions, please type them in the chat box and select Send to Host. Today we'll hear an overview of the Grid Deployment Office and a background on the study before moving on to an update on the study and draft results. We will have some time for Q&A at the end. Speaking of Q&A, we're going to run Q&A a little bit differently than we have in the past. You may submit your questions throughout the event using Minty. Please go to minty.com using your computer or mobile device and enter the code 130 2994. You can then enter your questions throughout the event. We ask that you keep this open and you like any questions that are submitted by other people throughout the event because the questions with the most likes will be where we start with our Q&A when we get to the time at the end. The link and the code to join us is also in the chat and you can use your phone to join uh, using the QR code that's on the screen now. <clears throat> Finally, the recording of today's webinar will be available in about two weeks on the Draft National Transmission Needs Study webinar webpage. We will notify you when that is available. To kick off today's meeting, you'll hear from Mar Maria Robinson, Director of the Grid Deployment Office, for some opening remarks. Maria, welcome. Thank you so much, Whitney, and welcome everyone today. Uh, my name is Maria Robinson. I lead the Grid Deployment Office here at the Department of Energy. And just want to welcome all of you to today's webinar. And we're so um, thankful for your interest in our transmission needs study. I believe we have a slide here that shows um, an overview of our relatively new office uh, that was started back in August of last year. So we focus on three different areas. Um, it largely uh, the Power Generation Assistance Division, which focuses on our Civil Nuclear Credit Program, which had a, a big announcement just yesterday, as well as our hydropower incentives. Um, our Transmission Division, which works on commercial facilitation, uh, planning, and uh, permitting related work for transmission. And of course, today uh, we will dig into the planning side of that fairly significantly. And our Grid Modernization Division that focuses on um, a lot of financial programs relating to resilience, um, as well as smart grid in incentives and grants, as well as a lot of technical assistance um, relating to all of the above topics. So we're really excited to be here today uh, and grateful for your participation in this and for those of you who have helped to participate um, in the draft uh, transmission needs study today, we are particularly grateful for your contributions. So with that, I will send it back to you, Whitney, and we can get started. Thank you so much. I would now like to welcome Jeffrey Dennis, the Deputy Director for Transmission Development with the Grid Deployment Office, to provide us with a background on the study. Jeff, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Whitney, and thank you, Maria. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Dennis, Deputy Director uh, for Transmission in the Grid Deployment Office. <clears throat> I'm going to provide just a couple of minutes of background on the need study before turning it over uh, to the real experts to get into uh, into the meat. As Whitney mentioned, when it or I'm sorry, as Maria mentioned, when it comes to transmission, the department and the grid deployment office are taking a, a three-pronged approach to address uh, our nation's transmission needs and the challenges to meeting those needs. Enhanced planning of transmission, and that's really where the work that you're going to hear about today fits. Siting and permitting, including support for states and local communities and federal permitting coordination, and commercial facilitation to help resolve commercial caps to transmission. Um, so the transmission needs study, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the transmission needs study uh, uh, is uh, part of that enhanced planning work, as I mentioned, um, and is uh, a, uh, a statutorily required, it's required under Section 216A of the Federal Power Act report that the department conducts uh, that is an assessment of historic transmission constraints and congestion uh, every three years. Um, this is what the department is, has classically referred to as its triennial state of the grid report. Um, previous iterations of this report have reviewed historic industry data. We've had previous studies published, as you see there, uh, four times. The most recent before this one um, was, was published in draft form in 2020 and not finalized. Um, but if we go to the next slide, uh, you will see um, a little bit of a graphical depiction here of how this study has changed in response to Congress's direction in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, in that historic bill, Congress amended uh, uh, the Federal Power Act Section 216A uh, in its direction to us to conduct a transmission needs study to not only consider historic transmission constraints and congestion, but also to look at expected future transmission capacity constraints and congestion in this three-year triennial state of the grid report with consultation from states, Indian tribes, and regional grid entities. And so today's report, uh, today's draft report that you will hear about looks a little bit different because we are responding to this direction uh, uh, of Congress to expand our analysis to look not just at historic constraints and congestion negatively impacting consumers, but also future expected transmission capacity constraints and congestion negatively impacting consumers. So this report taking that direction from Congress looks not only at historic industry data, but also re recent power system studies, a wide variety of studies that look at future needs and published capacity expansion results. And you'll hear a lot more about that in a minute. Uh, we are aiming to uh, publish a final report in 2023 following the public comment period that we have opened with the issuance of this draft. Um, and you'll hear in a minute uh, about how we did that. So let's move to the next slide and talk about how this transmission needs study will be used. It, can, it will help inform DOE's prioritization of future funding opportunities related to transmission. Um, and really, its primary role is to focus the attention of federal, state, and tribal policymakers, industry, and other stakeholders on the most pressing national and regional transmission needs. Uh, if we click forward one more time, uh, we also note that um, this study will also in help inform the designation of national interest electric transmission co corridors under that same section of the Federal Power Act, Section 216. It is important to note that the needs study today does not designate any national interest electric transmission corridor. Completion of the needs study is one prerequisite in order for the department to potentially designate such a corridor, but that actual designation will happen through a separate future process. And that future process will consider not just the needs study, but many other statutory factors uh, included by Congress, including included by Congress most recently in the bipartisan infrastructure law, including whether the designation will promote economic vitality, diversity of supply, reduction of consumer costs, and national energy security and independence. So if we flip to my last slide, um, I just want to give you a, an overview before you hear the details of really what this study intends to do, its objectives, and what it should not be misunderstood as doing, what it, what it really is not doing, and what other processes will do. Um, the object, objective of this study is to identify pressing national transmission needs. It does not prescribe, prescribe solutions or identify any sort of master plan or, or major transmission plan uh, that would solve these transmission needs. It is purely an assessment of needs and a comprehensive one. The, method is, uh, the methods that we used uh, are to consider existing data, that historic data I talked about, published reports, uh, and capacity expansion models. It does not conduct new modeling, new cost benefit analysis, or system planning. That happens in other procedures, in industry run planning procedures, and in other planning studies uh, that the department and others are undertaking. Uh, but that is not the transmission needs study today. 
And what the needs study does is it organizes these needs by geographic regions. But those regional designations are not synonymous with potential national interest electric transmission corridors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the study does not uh, identify corridors and does not designate corridors. That will happen in a separate process that the department announced uh, last January in the Building a Better Grid Initiative will be applicant driven and route specific and the department will uh, announce further plans on that um, in coming months. But today, um, this study is about needs and not about designation of corridors. So with that bit of background and overview, I wanna turn it over to, uh, back to Whitney, who will turn it over to Adria Brooks on our team uh, to lead you through the details of the study. Thank you so much, Jeff. We now welcome Dr. Adria Brooks, Transmission Engineer from the Grid Deployment Office to provide the updates on the, on the draft National Transmission Needs Study. Adria, I'll turn this over to you. Great, thanks Whitney. And thanks Jeff and Maria for kicking us off. If folks could also please submit their questions. Uh, the link was just dropped into the chat. If you submit your questions on Minty as I'm going, and then folks can upvote if they have the same question. That way we can try to prioritize questions, although we're leaving lots of time to try to get through all of them. Just a quick notice, um, none of the information presented herein is legally binding. Also, the content included in this presentation is intended to inform um, relate or for informational purposes relating to the draft National Transmission Needs Study. If there's any content in this presentation that appears discrepant from what's in the study itself, the study language supersedes what's in this presentation. All right, with that, I just want to give a brief overview of our outreach to date on the study. So in January of last year, the department kicked off what we called our Building a Better Grid initiative. In this initiative, we outlined several of the different programs that the department's going to be undertaking related to building a better grid, to increasing reliability of the grid, um, to integrate more clean energy resources, to, be, to lower costs for consumers. The NEED study is one programmatic activity. It was announced at that time. And then in March, we sent out preliminary notification to a handful of organizations, those organizations that Jeff mentioned that we're obligated to consult with. Um, so we met with national state associations, and we also announced the need study on the DOE tribal consultation webinar that happened that month. In July, we sent a formal notification letter to those same entities, and then also attended a number of conferences during the summer to announce the study and to talk to, to lawmakers at the state level. Then in October, we released what we're calling the consultation draft. And again, that went to those same entities, uh, tribes, states, the regional grid coordinators, to get their feedback on the draft study at that point. So our consultation period lasted from October through November. We received plenty of comments, and then staff worked to integrate those comments into the study that you all now have in front of you. So last Friday, we released the public draft version. Um, one reason for us trying to get this out last Friday is to give us as much time as possible for the public comment period. So the public comment period is now open. Uh, that will close on April 20th, and I have instructions at the very end on how you can submit comments. Part of the public comment period is including this webinar. We accept written comments. The email address is at the very bottom of all of these slides. You can also reach out to the email address if you have follow-up questions that you would like answered. Once the public comment period ends, DOE staff is going to work to revise any comments we receive try to integrate what we can into the study and then publish a final study in summer 2023. Here's just a really high level overview of the consultation comments that we received um, in October, November of last year. So 20 different entities submitted comments and among those entities, um, we calculate there were about 180 unique comments that came through. Here's just a general breakdown of them. So 61 were we're requesting to expand discussion in various parts of the needs study. 47 comments provided edits for clarity or suggesting where we need to clarify our language that, uh, so that things made some more sense. We also had 28 general comments. So for example, states letting us know about studies that they're undertaking uh, that eventually would be useful to include the needs study, maybe the next needs study three years from now. We had 15 uh, comments that corrected factual errors, 12 related to concerns of the scope of the study, a handful of requests for more information, and then just some small formatting suggestions, all of which we tried to resolve in the public version that you all have. So with that, 
all the comments and revisions that we received, all the comments we received in our attempts to revise based on those comments, those are provided in the appendix of the draft needs study. It's the last 80 pages or so of the needs study is in fact all those comments that we received. So now diving into the draft results of the study, here's the outline of the needs study. So of course, as an executive summary, there's an introduction which goes over a lot of the background information that Jeff covered, the legislative language that motivates the study, a chapter on transmission concepts to try to bring folks up to a similar page before diving into the results. Now those last four chapters really do focus on detailed results of the study. So the first one talking about historical data, understanding the current need of the power grid. The fifth chapter reviewing existing studies, so both current and future needs. And then the sixth chapter, final chapter, looking at capacity expansion modeling to try to understand anticipated future needs on the power grid. Here's the website again, although I imagine most of you have found this already since you're at the webinar, um, but if you need it, there is a website to go download the study itself. Now I'm gonna really just focus on results in this webinar. We're not gonna go over those first three chapters. So I'll talk about high-level summaries, um, executive summary, and then I'll really dive in to some of the detailed results later on. So here are the three big takeaways from the study when we're looking nationwide, right? So there's a pressing need for new transmission infrastructure. Interregional transmission is what results in the largest benefits. So of all the different ways to install transmission, looking at those facilities interregionally is really where we see the largest benefit to the power grid. And then finally, needs are gonna shift over time. So what we need today is different than what we need in 2030, which is different than what we need in 2040. So those needs are constantly evolving. So in the executive summary, we try to organize all the results, the detailed results in the rest of the report by these 13 geographic areas. Um, so we use this for purposes of the executive summary, and then it shows up a few times in the detailed report. We really wanted to understand how can we, or rather, how can we make the information, the detailed information understandable at just a high level when we look at these 13 regions. So part of doing that is that we were looking for geographic areas where a transmission need exists, could benefit from an upgrade or new transmission facility to do one of six things. So these are the high level buckets that we used for categorizing all the needs that we found in the study for the executive summary. And I'll go through them one by one so you can kind of see how these different needs fall into each region. So when we look at current need, the need to improve reliability and resilience on the power grid, also to alleviate congestion and unscheduled power flows, delivering low cost generation to high price demand areas, alleviating transfer capacity limits between neighbors, and going into the future, also to meet future demand with interregional transfer capacity and to meet future demand within region transmission deployment. So here's a high level summary of the regional needs. And again, all these that are in the executive summary are supported by the detailed findings, which I'll cover some of those in the rest of this webinar. I'm just going to run through each of these quickly. So it seems that nearly all regions in the US will benefit from improved reliability and resilience given additional transmission investments. Right? That showed up for almost all regions in the data that we looked at. High congestion in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, and New York could be mitigated by additional transmission assets. Also, unscheduled power flows in the West are prominent in California, the Northwest, and the mountain regions. Regions with high electricity costs, notably portions of the Plains, Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, New York, and California, will benefit from transmission that delivers cost-effective generation. And historically, the largest benefits in new interregional transfer capacity additions are found across the interconnection seams and in the middle of the country. So here, if we're just looking at historic data, we see these six regions in the middle of the country where we're already seeing a need to alleviate transfer capacity limits. However, once we start to look into the future, even up to 2040, there's going to be a significant need for new interregional transmission between nearly all regions. So in this case, in every region, there was a need to share with at least one of their neighbors in the future. So today, middle of the country, later on, almost everywhere. So that's an example of these changing needs of the grid. And then finally, significant transmission deployment is needed as soon as 2030 in the Plains, Midwest, and Texas regions. But by 2040, large deployments will also be needed in the mountain, mid-Atlantic, and southeast. So again, we're seeing more regions, these needs changing with time. Now, having gone over that, if you were sitting here in your region thinking, oh, one of those doesn't look quite right for us, I'm not sure why, 
This is the type of feedback that we would want to get during comment period to dive into the report, understand where we're pulling these findings from, and then please respond to us in that way. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into the first chapter that has detailed results. So looking at historical data, the first section of this chapter is historical transmission investments. The second section is looking at market price differentials. We do that both regionally, interregionally, and then also looking at transmission value during extreme events. Another section is on qualified paths in the West, and then finally a section on interconnection queues. Now because of time, I'm not going to go into detailed reports or detailed findings for all of these sections. I'm just going to focus on a handful of them. Okay, so one of the first findings is that we find that transmission investments decreased during the second half of the 2010s. So what's plotted here is load weighted circuit miles uh, for all the last decades, so 2011 through 2020. We present these as rolling through your averages to get rid of some of the lumpiness by which transmission lines come online. So it's broken out by region, so the number of circuit miles, and that's weighted by electric load for each region, understanding that if you have high load, you might have more need for transmission than if you have lower load. Now, the clustered bar charts um, all the way to the left, where it's labeled all regions, that's the entire United States. So we can see this increase in transmission that was installed up through 2015, and then that dropped off from 2015 to 2020. So there's certainly this increase in the beginning of the decade and then decrease the latter half of the decade. And that trend was generally true for all regions individually as well to differing degrees, right? So that was just something that stood out right away. You can also look at who is installing projects. So I found that non-incumbent developers' share of energized projects decreased from 20, from 40% in 2013 to less than 5% in 2020. So the peach color at the top of all these bar charts, these are non-incumbent developers' projects uh, or the share of their projects. Non-incumbent developers are also sometimes referred to as merchant developers. So in 2013, there was the most even mix between non-incumbent developers and the incumbent developers, the regulated utility developers, and the salmon color. But that also dropped off precipitously until 2020, where non-incumbent developers had less than 5% of all projects installed. In addition to looking at who was installing, we'll also look at why projects were installed. So about the share of projects addressing reliability concerns in purple, the bottom portion of each of these bar charts, concerns have increased. So in 2011, projects that were installed to address reliability concerns were about 50% of all projects. But in 2020, that increased to about 75%. We look at the share of high capacity projects, so those projects that are really high voltage meant to move generation long distances, shown here in light blue. Those decreased over the course of the last decade. So they had the most installs in 2013, about 50% of circuit miles installed were for high capacity projects. Um, and that decreased the latter half of the decade in 2020 where there were hardly any that were installed. So moving now to look at wholesale electricity prices, historic wholesale prices. Now, these prices reveal areas ex experiencing congestion today, where there's a difference between a high price region and a low price region really nearby that indicates that there's some type of congestion on the power grid. And the directions of these within region congestion that's maintained over time. So looking back even to 2012 data, we find the same areas that had low prices um, in the same areas at a high prices, that was consistent throughout all the decade. And in general, increased transmission capacity between these low price regions shown here in blue and the high price regions in red would help alleviate or could help alleviate those high priced regions by offering them low cost generation. Now it's much easier to see these congestion trends and instead of looking at average prices, which is done here, instead we look at where they're persistently low and high prices. So again, high prices in red, low prices in blue. This really helps us isolate areas that are strongly impacted by congestion, regardless of the average annual price, right? So energy prices change a lot, most linked to natural gas prices. So we can get rid of that if we just look at where they're persistently high and persistently low. So each one of these um, red dots, these pixels, this is a place on the grid where we measure wholesale electricity prices, right? So these nodes, if they're red, that means that these were the top 5% of electricity prices within that interconnect um, 
year, year after year. So really, really dark red, that means even four or five years in a row, consistently the most high prices, even on an hourly basis. The opposite is true for the dark blue. These are places on the grid where the prices were persistently low year after year. So this again really helps us isolate, okay, where would additional transmission assets help improve this congestion and potentially help reduce prices for consumers in these red regions. So then here's another way to look at this. This is research that was done by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Actually, the last few slides were also done by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab for us. Uh, but this section of the report was spun off into their own report. And there are links in the slides um, that you can also Google and go see webinar recordings of the researchers there presenting their own work. And I'll just give a high-level overview of it here. We found the largest congestion value of new transmission is across the interconnects and during extreme weather. So what's being plotted here, each of these black dots, we're showing the differences between wholesale prices, hourly wholesale prices, over the course of the year on average. So for example, if you were to look at that black dot in Phoenix, Arizona, that's not actually Phoenix, that's a hub price. So that would really represent the prices of all of Arizona, all of New Mexico. If you want to compare what's the difference between the prices in Arizona, New Mexico, against, for example, the prices in California to the west or ERCOT to the east, right, we see that there is a large difference in prices um, between Arizona and Texas, ERCOT. Where these high values exist, shown here by just the high number, but also the darker color links, that's indicative that there would be high value and more transmission capacity between those locations on the grid to help reduce congestion. So that really shows up when we look at Texas first with connecting with any of its neighbors, but then also connecting the eastern and the western interconnect. So shown here, connecting the west non-ISO to SPP. So highest value by connecting the three interconnects. There's also high value in this chart by connecting SPP and MISO. And that said, this is data from 2021, right, which was an extreme weather year for ERCOT, where they experienced really high prices because of power outages in February of that year. So if we were to look at different years, these numbers do drop off for Texas, but the same trends apply even going back to 2012. We see the highest value connecting across the interconnections and then also connecting SPP to its eastern neighbors. And then a quick look at the interconnection queues in each region. We find that power plants seeking transmission interconnection are facing increasingly long wait times. So in the 2000, 2010, wait times for power plants to connect to the power grid were a little over two years. Last decade, there were more than three and a half years to connect, right? There's lots of reasons why the interconnection queues are backlogged in the US. But one of those is that these power plants don't have adequate access to the existing transmission system, or there's a need for serious upgrades on the transmission system. And those costs can sometimes be cost prohibitive for the power generators versus doing that in a transmission planning setting. So shown here is the um, amount of interconnection, amount of um, power plants that are in the interconnection queue within each region. Majority of them are solar in yellow or blue storage, um, but there's also several wind in green and then also gas plants in gray in a handful of regions that are backlogged. Okay, so moving on from there to the next chapter, a review of existing studies. This is really capturing both current and future needs. We looked at 50 different studies in this chapter. As Jeff said, there are 80 different studies in the entire report, but just in this chapter alone, we looked at, eight, at 50 of them. These were studies that were uh, national in scope, sometimes regional in scope, occasionally just looking at one state's power grid. And going through all of that information, we were trying to look for patterns that would tell us about needs in the power system. And the way that we organized this chapter is kind of how those patterns fell out. So we have a subsection on reliability needs, also on resource adequacy concerns, clean energy, and some of the reliability concerns that come specifically with clean energy um, or the grid integration concerns that are specific to clean energy. Now I should say that clean energy in this report considers lots of different power generation technologies. So there's the obvious renewables that we think about when solar and biomass, but there's also nuclear, there's also fossil fuel plants, so gas or coal that have CCS technologies or carbon capture sequestration technologies included. All those are considered clean energy here, and they are in this section, 
but we did want to highlight offshore wind and also clean energy on tribal lands. Then there is a section on congestion, and we organize that by each geographic region. Curtailment of power generators based on the needs of the grid, resilience of the power grid, electrification, so recognizing that the needs that we're going to have as we electrify more and more end use devices, such as cars, turning those into electric vehicles, that's going to create different needs in the power system. A section on non-wires alternatives. So I'll note that this is really the first of our previous congestion studies and now the needs study. This is really the first one that focuses so heavily on non-wires alternatives. Throughout the report, we think of transmission as technology agnostic. So where a non-wire solution is beneficial and could um, support a need, then we want to bring that in. Other cases where we need a traditional wire to address a need, we want to make sure that we are calling that out too. So we do put some information in here on non-wires alternatives and how they could help support the power grid. And then finally, there's a section on barriers to transmission development. Here are the 50 studies that we reviewed. We had to give ourselves a cutoff point, right? So we stopped looking back at 2018, but for the majority of these were all of 2020, 21, and then the handful of 2022 that we included. I won't go through each study, but I'll just kind of name who the authors were um, in these general buckets. So about a fifth of them were all Department of Energy reports. So that's coming out of the national labs. Another fifth were consultant reports. So those who've been doing a lot of work in this space the last several years. There's a handful of academic reports. The vast majority of these, almost half of them, came from industry itself. So the RTOs, so NERC, and then also the national and the regional reliability coordinators. So I wanted to get both the national and the regional perspective there. There's a handful of groups here as well, so like the independent market monitors that are looking at them, the market specifically. But to the extent that they are tied to the transmission system, we brought that in as well. I'm not going to talk about the findings here, but did just want to show the variety of the different types of authors and reports that we were able to pull in. Okay. So finally, I'm going to talk about the last chapter, capacity expansion modeling and anticipated future need. So this is really uh, what's unique, right, about this study from compared to previous congestion studies is that they weren't able to look at anticipated future need. So we did that here. So I'll spend a lot of time in this chapter. This is organized as including studies and scenarios. So what studies did we use when we were working on this data? Within region transmission deployment, interregional transfer capacity results, and then also international transfers. I'm just going to talk about the first three. I'm happy to answer questions about international transfers if they come up but because of time. I'm just going to focus here. Okay, so data from six different capacity expansion studies were analyzed to identify future regional and interregional transmission needs. Four of those studies came from the national labs, notably the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And then two academic reports were included, so research done by Princeton University and then also by Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. There were some other consultant academic reports that we tried to work in, but because of data quality issues or data being proprietary and not available to the public, we were not able to incorporate them, so we were left with these six. I want to say something about capacity expansion models for those who aren't familiar with it. So these are models that optimize for least cost power sector solutions. They're looking nationwide, and they use a large range of input assumptions. So for example, how much demand are we going to have nationwide or within each region in a future year? What's the cost of energy going to be? How hard is it going to be to site different types of power plants in different places? What state or federal policies might come online that are going to impact the power system? There are a lot of input assumptions. Once they have those inputs, they then can decide, all right, this is the optimal generation mix and the optimal amount of transmission that we're going to need uh, to, to meet resource adequacy concerns to provide enough electricity to consumers. Now, these model results really help identify quantities of cost-effective transmission solutions. And they're used here as a proxy for future need to meet generation and demand growth. All right, so of these six different studies, there were, uh, there were 300 scenarios among them. And they describe a really wide range of power sector futures in different years. All right, okay, so each dot here, this is one of those 300 scenarios. And they're plotted for three different years, so 2030, 2035, and 2040. Each color of the dot is indicative of which study it came from. So you can see the spread there by the different studies. 
on the y-axis, this is plotted carbon emission reductions from 2005 levels. Right, okay, so if we just focus on 2030, we can see that these dots range anywhere from 25% carbon emission reductions from 2005 levels up to 80% reductions, right, with a lot in between. Now today we're at about 40% on the power sector, um, which is to say that some of these dots that are less than 40% assume that between now and 2030 we're going to be um, we're going to be putting more carbon emissions into the air, whereas a good majority of them assume we're going to be uh, emitting less carbon emissions, so increasing that power emission reduction level. That's a really wide range, 25 to 80%, and that just grows with time. So in 2035, these scenarios assume that everywhere from 10% carbon emission reductions up to even 100% carbon emission reductions. And again, in 2040, that continues to get larger with uh, more scenarios. So you can imagine the transmission system and the generation mix that is going to accommodate everywhere from 10% carbon emission reductions up to 100% is going to look very, very different. Right? So we need to have some way to try to understand uh, the results coming out of all these disparate scenarios. And I should also note that carbon emission reductions is plotted here, but there are lots of other power sector characteristics that we could and did plot as we're trying to look at this data and understand it. Right, so total load on the grid, um, what type of generation gets, uh, gets installed, most likely where, right? But there's lots of other things that we could have looked at. And we saw these really large spreads in these scenarios too um, for all those different characteristics. So this is a very wide ranging group of scenarios. Okay, so with that, we needed a way to look at the different scenarios in order to understand the results. So we did that by looking at the underlying scenario characteristics. So this is just illustrative data. It's not real data, obviously. I'm going to show the real data in the next slide, but just to help orient everyone. So we take those same 300 scenarios from the last slide, and we put them here on this plot where we have clean energy in 2040 on the x-axis, and then electricity load in 2040 on the y-axis, right? And then the dots, the location changes based on those two things. We can focus in on this 2021 diamond. So this is the clean energy and electricity load mix in 2021. So any dot to the right of that green diamond means that there was a growth in clean energy between 2021 and 2040. Same thing, any dot that's above 2021, that means there was a growth in total electricity load between 2021 and 2040. So with that, there were three major groups that really popped out when we plotted the data this way. The first one is this moderate load, moderate clean energy growth group, or what we call mod mod or moderate mod throughout the report. There are about 80 or so scenarios that fell into this group. Of those scenarios, many of them were market driven, which means that the researchers took out all state policies, local policies, federal policies that were on the books at the time, just removed them and just said, okay, how is the power grid going to change over the next so many years based on only markets alone? So a lot of those scenarios fell here. There are also scenarios that included existing state, local, federal policies. And when I say existing, I mean what was on the books at the time the research was done. All six studies were published different years, so they all may include slightly different policies. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have these high load, high clean energy growth scenarios. So there were not any scenarios that fell into this group that were driven by markets alone or even existing policies new state or federal policies would have to come online to really push the power sector to this high load, high clean energy growth scenario group. And then finally, there was this middle category, so the moderate load, high clean energy growth. So again, the load not changing a whole lot compared to 2021, but the clean energy growth was pretty substantial. There's a wide mix of scenarios that fell into this group. So both those that were driven by markets alone those that were driven by existing policies, again, those that were on the books at the time the research was done, and then also scenarios that assume new state or federal policies would come online to impact the power system. I want to also provide a quick note on the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA. All six studies were done before IRA was announced, right, or signed and became a law. Because of that, none of them include the tax incentives and a lot of the things that were in the Inflation Reduction Act. So both DOE internal modeling and lots of external modeling has been done since IRA came out to try to understand how is that going to push the power sector in the future. And we think that the new normal, the new power sector, is going to wind up in this moderate high group. So before IRA, we might have said, okay, 
our moderate moderate group here is going to be our business as usual case. That's where the 2040 system is going to be. But now it seems that our new normal is in this moderate high case. Okay, so here's the real data. Each black dot, again, is a scenario. We removed the color coding, so all the studies are just combined together here. These red circles, um, these are kind of like a topographical map. It's a two-dimensional histogram, so you can see these like three mountains kind of popping out of the screen towards you. That shows how many scenarios kind of fell within each of those mountains. This is where we got our three different scenario groups from, so our mod mod, mod high, and high high groups. Okay, so just to summarize, so all the study scenarios are broken into those three groups, like we just went over, the mod mod, mod high, and high high group. There are between 60 and 85 scenarios that fell into each group. And the transmission results were analyzed within each group for three different years, so 2030, 2035, and 2040. So in the need study itself, we actually present results in these nine different portions of this matrix. So you can go in and look at, okay, if I'm only interested in mod mod, you know, transmission solutions in 2040, what would that mean for each region? Right, so you can do that. Today I'm just going to talk about the mod high results in 2035, and I'll, I'll show a glimpse also of 2030. And then just to provide a really quick overview of what you're going to see on the next couple slides. So the makeup of the future power system is unknown, right? So there is a range of study results that we present. We don't assume that we're just going to hit one scenario is going to be correct, and therefore we're only going to present one number. We do provide a range of results. So all the regions are going to be on the y-axis. And then the gray bar is existing transmission, um, as recorded by the researchers when they did the study. The green bar is going to be that range of estimated future need. Um, so our result range, it's in this is more, there's more detail in the, res, in the paper itself, right? But the interquartile range is IQR is what we use. That is just the fancy stats name for the middle 50% of all of the scenarios that are within this group. But importantly, the gap between the existing transmission in gray and then the range of future need in green. That's the gap to fill between now and then whatever date we're showing. In this case, it's going to be 2035. Okay, so with all the disclaimer, here is here are the results for the regional transmission expansion. Again, 2035 and that moderate high group are new normal, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. So you can see all the regions stacked up on the left on the y-axis. Also include a map here just to help orient folks. And then they are arranged based on how much total transmission is anticipated to be needed in 2035. We're going to focus in on the top four. So uh, the regions with the largest need here going into 2035 is the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, and the Plains region. Now this is total or absolute new trans or sorry, absolute transmission needed in 2035. It's not necessarily how much needs to be installed between now and then. If we look at that gap to fill, then our top four come out as the Midwest, Southeast Plains, then also Texas, where there's um, a lot of transmission need to be built there in order to get into this cost optimal range. Then there's a quick look at who has the least need for new transmission. So Florida, California, New England, and New York. Okay, so that's where we need to be in 2035. Now it's natural for the next question to be, how close are we to realizing these futures? And this is a comparison of the utility plans against those same results. Um, so before those green bars, they were horizontal. We've now turned them vertically. Then also another, this is 2030 data, not 2035. So, you know, how much transmission do we need in 2030 on our way to get to the 2035 need? The gray diamonds are utility plans. The reason we use 2030 is because utility plans, at least for the data set that we had, stopped at 2030, so they didn't go out to 2035. Now, we can see that in a handful of regions, in those regions that were at the bottom of the last chart, New England, New York, Florida, and California, the utility plans either meet or exceed the anticipated range suggested by the capacity expansion results. In all other regions, utility plans are falling short. I'll make a quick note here that the data set that we used was from NERC's Energy Supply and Demand 2020 database. Um, not all utilities reported their plans, their transmission development plans through this database, so we recognize that these utility plans are likely an underestimate. This was the best data that we had to look at, um, look at all the regions at a national scale. Okay, 
Um, and then finally, we can do the same thing for interregional transfer capacity. So this is again 2035 mod high, our new normal results. And we can do the same thing, which is understand where are we today and where do we anticipate we need to be in 2035. We'll just focus on the top four, so the largest transfers that we see from the mid-Atlantic to the Midwest, Midwest to the Plains, Delta to the Plains, and then also Mountain to the Northwest. We do the same thing. I'm just looking also at where is the largest growth that needs to happen. And now we see Plains and Texas coming online. We're not as much of absolute total need in 2035 compared to some other transfers, um, but at least a long way to go compared to what's there today. And then again, we'll just highlight also the bottom four regions in terms of amount of new capacity to come online. So the Plains Southwest, California Mountain, Mountain to Plains, and then the Delta to Midwest regions. Okay, so finally, here is how you comment on the report. So to comment on the needs study, please email your comments as a PDF attachment to this email address, the same email address that's been at the bottom of all the slides needstudy.comments at hq.doe.gov. The deadline is April 20th, and that's assuming the Federal Register is posted as it's scheduled to be on Monday. If for some reason that's pushed back to Tuesday or Wednesday, then you all would have a couple extra days also to get your comments in. So I want to thank you all for your time, and I'll turn it back over to you, Winnie. Thank you, Adria. So we now have time for Q&A. Please put your questions into Minty now. We'll put the information back here in the chat. There's also the ability to like your questions, so please go in and do that, because we're going to start with the questions that have the most votes. Um, so we'll get, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so Adria, what jurisdiction does DOE have to plan transmission? How does DOE's transmission planning jurisdiction differ from that of RTOs slash ISOs or balancing authorities? Who plans the transmission system? Sure, so a lot of this is going to be covered in that third chapter of transmission concepts of the study. So the RTOs, the transmission planning regions where an RTO doesn't exist, are those that are in charge of planning the system in the real world, right? So they use a lot of really high-level modeling and they understand their regional grid very well. They're the experts there. So for example, the capacity expansion models that are used here that's often just a single step that is done, or maybe even the first step that's done in doing a transmission planning uh, process. There would be subsequent planning models after that to really understand, okay, we generally think this is how much transmission we need, and this is where we think it needs to go. Now let's actually try integrating that into our existing system and then running lots of different reliability models to be sure that we can sustain uh, those new transmission systems and that they are providing the benefit that we think they're going to. So that's being done right now also at a national level in the DOE's National Transmission Planning Study, which is a separate study from this one. And what's unique there um, is that they are going to, they're not just doing the capacity expansion models, which are included here, they're also doing all those subsequent kind of downstream models as well to ensure that the grid would be reliable. Now the reason they're doing that is because the regions, the RTOs, they really only plan the grid for their region, for their jurisdiction, as they're responsible to do, as they're required to do. Um, so that doesn't mean they don't have great visibility into what's happening a region or two over. So by DOE looking at this, we're able to try to understand comprehensively what's happening at the national system if we were to do this type of planning at the national level. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, we have another popular question here. How does the study take into account energy needs that might be fulfilled with transmission alternatives, such as energy conservation initiatives, demand response, DER, and other non-wire alternatives. Great, so we try to cover non-wire alternatives in a few places um, where we really call them out in the way that they can help alleviate needs in the power grid. Notably, that section in Chapter 5 that highlights non-wire alternatives, um, we talk about a lot there. But in general, when we use the word transmission in this report, we mean that technology agnostic. So transmission doesn't automatically mean a new wire. It just means anything that could serve the role of transmission. So that could be non-wire alternatives like DERs. I think I have a slide that talks about how DERs were used in the capacity expansion models. Um, so let me see if I can pull that up really quickly. Okay, 
So this is that same scenario chart that you all saw with those 300 scenarios. Of those 300, 47 of them were considered high DR scenarios, or more than 200 terawatt hours of DRs nationwide. That number um, came from one of the cited reports in Chapter 5 that talks about the importance of DERs to support a national power grid, and they defined high DR using this 200 terawatt hour numbers. That's where we got it. So there are 47 different uh, scenarios of the 300. Um, about half of them fell into the mod-mod group, another half fell into the mod-high group, um, maybe not half and half, I don't remember the exact ratio, whereas there weren't any high DR scenarios um, that fell into the high-high group. So that is to say that distributed resources are baked into the capacity expansion results that we show. We did a little bit of trying to understand how might the results of transmission need in the future change based on whether or not a scenario had high DR. I think the assumption going in is that, okay, if we have lots of distributed resources, then we won't need as much transmission in the future. We didn't necessarily find that to be true when we look at the results. Um, the, even those scenarios that had high distributed resources still had pretty significant amounts of transmission builds. So that, that's detailed a little bit in the report. We did try to pull that out based on consultation feedback. Um, so there's more on this chart in the report as well. Thank you. Um, another popular question here. Transmission built to equalize energy prices leaves one region worse off to lower prices for another region. Transmission itself is very costly. Does DOE have a fair cost allocation framework in mind? Yeah, so Jeff addressed this a little bit in the beginning. Um, we do not include cost benefit analysis when looking at transmission. That's something that the RTOs do when they're trying to plan which transmission to build and where. So at this high level, unless there was a report that included specific cost benefit analyses, and there were a few in there, we're not doing new modeling to try to capture what that cost benefit analysis should be based on the capacity expansion results or other places. So if it was already published or was in a report, then it is included here, but it's not included perhaps in this last chapter, which maybe they were referring to for the capacity expansion modeling. Again, that's something that the RTOs are required to do, which is something that's really important for them when they're looking about where transmission should go. All right, um, everybody continue upvoting your favorite questions here. Um, another popular one, roughly how many transmission developers is GDO speaking with about the various DOE support sources? When will the first transmission projects be selected for support? So for the needs study, this is just an assessment of what's going on um, on the power grid today. Um, I don't have any information or data about the number of developers we're talking to or the other programs. So this author might be referring to some of the other kind of funding programs that we have going on that um, Maria would talk about and Jeff talked about a little bit in the beginning, uh, but that's not within scope here, so I don't have those numbers. Thank you. How important will this study be as opposed to other sources of information for the corridor designations? Great, yeah, so I'll go back to the slide that Jeff showed. Um, in the Federal Power Act, as it was amended by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Secretary has a really wide range of discretion of things that she can consider, um, and the full list is in the Federal Power Act. But I'll pull up the summary here. All right, so the needs study is just one of many things. So the Secretary will be looking at the results of the needs study and trying to understand, okay, how would any pr project that is proposed for a NITSI corridor um, alleviate the needs as found in the study? But there's also lots of other information that she's going to be able to consider. So this is one part of several, several factors that she gets to look at. Uh, but everything that she'll look at is statutorily laid out in the Federal Power Act. Um, so that's listed there. Great. Um, this next question I can answer. <laughs> it says, will the presentation slides be shared later? Um, I see it continues to be upvoted. So we will post a recording of this session um, up on the site, and we'll share that site at the end of this webinar, just so you guys can grab it in the chat at that time. Um, give us about two weeks, but we will send you a note when it is available. So if we get it up sooner, you'll get it sooner, but you'll definitely get it within two weeks of today. Um, all right. Now to a question that you can answer. <laughs> 
Uh, what steps is DOE taking to standardize the approach by which utilities and transmission operators will be obligated to share network models to ensure transparency and commitment to renewables integration? So I don't have any information on that. Um, if there is any work being done, it wasn't included here in the needs study, so sorry that I can't answer it. Um, that's the type of thing where if that question comes in, you could email the link here, and then we can try to answer that for you if that answer exists, but I don't have it. Sorry. Completely fine. Um, sorry, they're changing on me as I'm trying to ask the question. <laughs> Um, all right. One of the major limitations on processing interconnection queues is a lack of human resources, particularly qualified electrical engineers. Does DOE have a plan for expanding a trained workforce? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have heard that not just through this study, but I think the department has heard that in our work with RTOs and try to understand their needs and what they're facing. Um, so there are several workforce development programs ongoing at the Department of Energy. Um, I don't necessarily know how that is specific to interconnection queues as a whole, but I do know there is a lot of funding coming through for workforce development. Again, there are some, uh, we have some of that information is publicly available on our website. So again, if you want to email us, we can try to send you to the correct links, but not something that I have here today for you. All right. Were line losses considered in the study? Good question. So line losses came up a little bit in Chapter 5, I believe, when we were reviewing other studies that were put out. And line losses were considered to differing degrees in the capacity expansion modeling. But some of those really detailed um, transmission modeling aspects, you have to go to the underlying um, specifics of the six studies themselves to figure out exactly how they handled it. So we didn't intentionally add any line loss data to what we did here, but to the extent that it was already included in other studies and it would be captured here. All right. When the final needs study discuss major, or sorry, will the final needs study discuss major reasons why high capacity projects uh, HB decreased and why the non-income incumbent share of the projects have also decreased? I need to reread it, let me know. Um, so we did include a short section at the end of Chapter 5. Or I actually don't know that it's that short. We did include a section at the end of Chapter 5 on barriers to transmission development. Um, and that was a change we made after consultation feedback where they asked us to add that in. So that is captured a little bit there, but it doesn't address why incumbent versus non-incumbent. So we didn't dive into why that might be the case, but we did just see that coming through in the data. So we wanted to capture that uh, in the study, but we're not trying to understand, or we didn't try to understand exactly why that is in the study itself. The quality of the reports that provide the basis of the needs study vary significantly in both their assumptions and robustness of their analy analytical methodology. How is this re reconciled in the report? Yeah, absolutely. So part of that is our ability to try to capture lots of different studies, right? So really trying to cast a wide net is one way to try to help with that. Um, we didn't, so yeah, so that was really the big thing, was just looking for lots of different studies, being sure that they're ones that were publicly available, ones that have gotten attention by industry um, or you know, by consultants, by academia, wherever it is that they were published. Um, so those that were generally considered reputable and that have been shared widely and just known about. So that's what we use. And again, do recognize that there's different levels of quality. All studies are looking at slightly different things, right? So again, trying to capture that wide net is the best we could do there. Great. Um. Oh, this one just got upvoted here. Uh, why is it ex acceptable to exclude the Southeast from your results? It may not be an ISO, but there still has to be some data available, right? Okay, so this is probably referring to the section on wholesale electricity prices. So let me jump up there. Um, so in this data set, we were looking at wholesale electricity prices, and the Southeast was not included just because they don't trade at the wholesale level, so we don't have access to the wholesale pricing 
the way we do in the RTO regions. Now I'll note that that is also true in the West. So the non-California uh, West also doesn't trade um, all of their energy in a wholesale price, but or sorry, in a wholesale market, they only trade. I think it was about five percent of their energy. That detail is in the report, so don't hold me to that. But there's a small fraction of energy that the West does trade um, in the in the markets in the West. So that we were able to capture. But the same applies to the West. If there was if the West did trade in an RTO, um, then we would be able to have more visibility into that data. That said, this is the only section where the Southeast isn't included. All of the sections of the report, the Southeast is included. It was just this particular data set where we don't have transparency into the Southeast wholesale prices, so we couldn't do this type of congestion analysis here. That makes sense. Um, can you speak to international transfers, Canadian Hydro, and how DOE may evaluate that? Sure, yeah, so this is again in the report. I didn't go over it, but I'll just show the results briefly here. So, um, okay, so here are the international transfers that we see between the different US regions and then their Canadian or Mexican counterparts across the way. So same thing where the, well, this chart is a little different than what I showed previously. So existing transfer capability is not shown here. This is only new transfer capacity that we're seeing in 2035 at the international stage. So I want to point out, though, that this is for the moderate, moderate scenario group. There was only one study that even considered international transfers when they were looking at the capacity expansion models, right? So we only have one study of the six, only a subset of the scenarios, and they only looked at that lower assumption group, that moderate, moderate. So it doesn't even capture what's going to be necessary now under our new normal given the Inflation Reduction Act. So with that caveat in mind, we did do our best to try to look at this data, recognizing that it was pretty limited. Now, all of these are trade-offs, right? So if a region is found that it's cost optimal for them to tra trade with Canada, for example, um, and they choose to trade more than what is suggested in the capacity expansion models, you can maybe look at the other results too and see, oh, maybe they don't need to trade as much with their American neighbors in that case, because they chose to trade more with Canada and vice versa. So all these things are trade-offs. Uh, we don't have perfect insight into what this would be, obviously, in the moderate high scenario group or that high high scenario group, because we're limited by data. But where we could find it, we try to tease it out. Um, and we do make some comments in the report to try to capture and caveat that appropriately. That is also something that we got some feedback on during the consultation uh, period. Great. I love that you've got all the extra slides here to answer some of these questions. Um, is the DOE's position that generator interconnection customers should have their interconnection network upgrade costs subsidized by end users via transmission expansion? Well, I can't speak to any official DOE position on that, but we have noted in other subsequent reports, and again, those that were brought in to this study, um, just different reasons as to why the interconnection queues are backlogged. So can't speak to DOE's position on what should change, but just acknowledging some of the barriers that we have seen um, from the data and want to pull that out. Are future needs like generator retirements, resource adequacy, and state RPS needs tracked in the study? Sorry, Winnie, can you repeat that? Absolutely. Are future needs like generator retirements, resource adequacy, and state RPS needs tracked in the study? Okay, great. So we don't, uh, so in terms of tracking them, we don't necessarily line those out or outline what those are going to be into the future. We didn't bring that data in. But that data is captured in the underlying reports that were used for the capacity expansion model to an extent. So. Um, the class financial models do have some insight into where generators are going to be retired into the future. And if they have hard numbers on that, they're able to bring that in. Um, all of the, I, most of the class financial models, I think all, but that is a good question that I would have to get back to this person if they want to email um, or just write a comment when they submit comments to the to need study. We can be sure that we pull that out. Um, I believe most of the class financial models do also, they do a quick check for resource adequacy concerns. Um, so they don't do full detailed reliability analysis by any means. But they do do a pretty quick resource adequacy check to be sure that the transmission and the generation that they're installing uh, would meet resource adequacy metrics. 
Uh, so some of that is captured in the capacity management model, but it's not fully brought out. Oh, and the other question was on state RPS policies. Yes, yeah, so any state policy that was on the books at the time the research was done should be captured in many of these capacity expansion models, um, but not necessarily looking into future RPS standards. I don't know that any of the studies were able to identify that. Maybe if they had been announced beforehand, they're able to bring that in, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh -oh. How is both short and long duration storage treated? Will you do a scenario assuming that the DOE moonshot goal of reducing the cost on long duration storage by 90% is still is met and also other percent reductions? Sure. So just to be clear, in this study, we're not doing any new modeling. Um, new modeling is being done in other studies, like the National Dimension Planning Study, like I mentioned. But here, we're only memorializing publications that have already come out. That said, a lot of the capacity expansion models do see a lot of new storage coming online in their scenarios. So they have a range of cost metrics. Some may include some pretty aggressive cost reductions for storage. In those scenarios, I don't know exactly which ones or the percentage of them. But to the extent that that's captured, there were a lot of scenarios that saw a lot of storage coming online. Now, we only focus on the transmission results in this study, um, but you could go to the underlying studies that we consider to understand what storage generation mix that they saw uh, looking out into future years. But we don't have that here since we were just focused on transmission. Great, thank you. Burial of HVDC transmission on existing highway or rail rights of way is brushed off using old studies that apply to overhead AC lines. Will DOE use recent applicable studies in the, fi in the final study? Great. So if there are studies that you think we should have included in this that we didn't, that is certainly something you can put forward into comments. And that is something that's getting a lot of attention, um, the idea of using existing right-of-ways. So to the extent that that can be captured in other studies the department's are doing, absolutely. And again, if you think there are published studies that should have been included here, um, then we can. Then please submit that to your comments for us to consider to add them into the, the final version. We still have plenty of questions coming in. Uh, how will new transmission wires be built when no one wants them in their backyard? Eminent domain is a long and expensive proposition. Yeah, so there's a little bit on um, eminent domain, I believe, in the barriers to transmission development. Um, we're talking about, and there's also some more recent reports that have come out about this. Um, just in regards to what are the barriers to transmission development. They don't necessarily find that it's just um, landowner, you know, not desiring them on their property, although that certainly does come up, but that's not necessarily the biggest uh, barrier to transmission development. And that's not particularly well moralized in this study, um, but that has come out more recently in some other studies. So this is, again, if this is something where there's data that we can point to, or there's a study that we can point to that really helps to try to put numbers to that or to help frame that, that would be something to submit um, in co public comment groups that we can consider adding it in. But we don't address anything regarding the, um, the public wanting or not wanting transmission in the study itself, since we're really just focusing on needs and didn't want to focus too much on the barriers um, or any solutions moving forward. So I think this question goes back to one of your charts. Um, are there specific large lines that drove the large capacity expans expansions in such around 2013, or were the capacity increases geographically dispersed? Are there known drivers? Okay, that is a great question and not one that I have a good chart for. Um, so, so this section of the report, we only grouped this nationally, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that is a great idea for something that we could include in the final. So if there was a desire to see this data broken out by into the 13 regions, um, then noting that in your comments is something that we could consider doing. But I'm pretty sure we only looked at this at a national level. Uh, so I don't have an answer for you there. I would expect that these high capacity projects were only in a handful of regions. They weren't you know, shared equally across the entire US, but I just don't have that data in front of me right now. But happy to consider adding that to the final report assuming we can tease that out of the data, which I think we could. Great. 
we got two questions that keep going back and forth here on which one they want next. Um, given that there is a high value of connecting ERCOT and the West, do the high values still hold if price spikes during extreme weather are not included? They do, yes. Um, so again, this is 2021 data, so this is where we see the highest value because of the extreme weather in ERCOT that year. But even at years where there wasn't a lot of extreme weather, or at least not in ERCOT, we still see that high value. Um, let me see if I have a chart lined up that covers that. I think there's one in here. Okay, so here's one um, going from 2012 to 2021. So 2021 data is still included here, but this also now is looking at all of the last decade or most of it to 2021, 2012, I'm sorry. Um, so we still see the highest value in connecting ERCOT to other regions. Now, the report that we pulled this from um, did just submit an update, um, or sorry, publish an update recently with 2022 data as well. Um, so you can go to the underlying report and, and to Lawrence Berkeley National Labs website to try to pull that and look at also the 2022 data, but it's not captured. Um, well, no, I take it back. Some of that is captured actually in the needs study. We were able to get that in before we published this most recent version, although it wasn't in the previous version. So there is some 22 data also in the needs study. Um, anyway, answer the question is yes, we still see that even if we don't look at 2021, if we look at other years, we still see the high value in connecting across the interconnections. Great. All right, we've got time for about two more questions. So um, reliability, according to your slides, is the first reason to build new transmission. As extreme weather events and EMPs are a primary concern it moved for society, does DOE recommend burying long HVDC lines? Well, there's no recommendations in here in terms of future solutions, so I want to make a statement about whether we recommend burying lines. Um, but that is a solution that I know a lot of communities are looking at specific to their needs, where if they know that they're particularly vulnerable to, for example, high wind events like hurricanes or something else, where bearing might be safest or most reliable for them, that might be a solution at the regional level that's not necessarily needed nationwide, right? So these are pretty unique uh, solutions that need to be implemented regionally based on regional needs. All right, and then um, we are coming up on time, so this is the last question. What type of data slash information can utilities provide to GDO in the future to facilitate studies? What is the best way to get involved? That is an excellent question, um, and I wish I had come up with a really good answer before we started the webinar. So as you're going through the report, oh, I guess I'll have two answers. As you're going through the report, if you recognize, oh, I have access to data that's not included in here, or I am aware of data that's not included in here that does point to a really important need of the power system, that is absolutely something that we would love to hear about in the comments. Um, the National Transmission Planning Study is doing a pretty comprehensive work to try to understand what data they need access to in order to really do planning well. Um, so that's maybe a separate question for them as to what they need in terms of new data. But for here, I will just say that um, if you go through and you see, okay, we're lacking data in this place, please suggest that so that we understand where we should be looking for data in the future or for the next version of this report. Um, and again, email address at the bottom of all these slides is how you can get in touch with us with those types of ideas um, and submit as formal comments. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for all of those excellent questions and for upvoting to get your questions asked. Um, this does wrap up today's webinar. The recording, as I mentioned before, will be available in about two weeks on the Draft National Transmission Needs Study webinar webpage. To find more information about the Draft National Transmission Needs Study, please visit the program webpage, and you can find that link in your chat now. Um, Maria, Jeff, Adria, thank you so much for leading us through this today. And thank you to all of our attendees for participating. Um, if we did not get to a question or something like that, please reach out to this email um, address, needsstudy.comments at hq.doe.gov. Take care, everyone, and we will see you next time.